Welcome to NCIX Tech Tips. Today we're going to be doing a bit of a follow-up to the RAID 0 and RAID 1 episode that we did very recently. We're going to have a look at some higher levels of RAID, so we're going to show a demonstration of RAID 5. We're going to talk a little bit about RAID 6, and we're also going to look at RAID 10, which is basically RAID 0 and RAID 1, hence the 10. <laughs> Now, if you remember from our RAID 1 explanation, we needed double the amount of actual storage space versus what we can actually put on it. So if we have two terabytes worth of drives, we can only store one terabyte of data. Higher levels of RAID get around this and are much more cost effective because in order to get two terabytes of storage out of a RAID 5, you only need three drives. To get three terabytes, you only need four drives. So what it's doing is it's using one drive worth of space and it's spread out among all the drives in the array to store enough data to rebuild if one drive fails. So look at it this way. If this drive goes down or this drive goes down, we can still have all two terabytes or all three terabytes of data stored there by just putting a new drive in and allowing it to recalculate what the data was. Now that calculation, that's where a dedicated RAID card comes in because RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 10, these are all very simple. There's no calculation. But with this one, the write speeds on a RAID 5 are going to be incredibly slow unless you're using a processor, and this is where a dedicated RAID card comes in, to make them go faster. So RAID 6 is much like RAID 5 except even more fail safe. In RAID 6, you lose two drives worth of storage capacity. So you can see here, with a four drive RAID 6, you only get two terabytes. That doesn't even make any sense because you might as well just do a RAID 1 and get two terabytes. It's much more fail safe. But as soon as you start to scale beyond that, with five drives, you get three terabytes and you can lose any two random drives in the array and still be able to rebuild it. Now, Performance, that's where it suffers because RAID 6, even with a dedicated RAID controller, is going to write data to the drive very, very slowly, even though both of them will still read data at OK rates. So this is great for something like a file server where you're archiving all of your media or something like that, and it's as simple as, oh, a drive went down, you throw a new one in, you rebuild the array, great, but you don't actually need to write a whole lot to it. So that's a dedicated RAID card. That's what you're going to need pretty much if you want to run RAID 5 or RAID 6. But for you guys watching at home, let's talk a little bit about RAID 10. RAID 10 is practical up to about four drives. And the way it works is it's, it is what it looks like. It's RAID 1 and RAID 0 combined. So what we're doing is we're taking two RAID zeros. So look at this. Okay, we're going to take our 0. We're going to write it to this drive and this drive. We're going to take our 1. We're going to write it to this one and this one. So these are a RAID 0 stripe, each of these. We take those two things and we RAID 1 them together. So basically what you're doing is you're writing to all four drives and reading from all four drives at exactly the same time. It means that four drives, assuming they're all one terabyte to keep the math simple, equals two terabytes of actual storage. But there is some fault tolerance here as well. You can lose this one, and then you can lose this one, and you still have all of your data because the, let's see, the one was stored here, and the zero was stored over here, you still have everything. If you lose both from one side, yeah, you're in trouble, but a RAID 10 is actually fairly resilient considering that there's zero calculation involved in it, and you can run it with an onboard RAID controller, and you get RAID 0 performance with that data safety. So in terms of finding a balance between cost and data safety and storage space, RAID 5 looks like a great option, but I wanted to get into a little bit more detail about why a dedicated RAID 5 controller is a great idea if you're looking to build a, like a home server or anything else where you'd want to archive your data to keep it safe. So here we've got a quick HD tune run of the RAID 5 volume with three Hitachi drives on the Intel onboard RAID. So this is on the onboard RAID controller on this motherboard. You can see right here, actually I'll just get the cameraman to have a look. But the ones that I want to draw your attention to are the average write speed. This is writes. Remember, I talked about how reads are fine on RAID 5, uh, even with an onboard controller, but writes is where you're going to suffer. 
Average writes are around 100 megabytes per second, and check out the CPU usage. CPU usage is at about 3.5%. Now, if we look at what we were able to do with our Adaptech RAID controller, this is a 5445. We were able to do average writes of 200 megabyte per second. We're talking double the performance and CPU usage around 2.8%. So that means that it's using that onboard processor, A, to make the calculations to write data to the drives much faster, and B, to keep the CPU usage down when you're writing to your drives. So to drive the point home of how much dramatically better a dedicated RAID card will perform an onboard RAID. We had a look at the PC Mark Vantage hard drive suite. You can see on our dedicated Adaptech RAID card, we got a value of 7,000 PC Marks, whereas on our onboard RAID, we saw only 3,700 PC Marks. And I'll scroll down and let you have a look at the data rates. But there's more to it than that. See, these calculations give us way better performance, but they also give us some other benefits as well. When you're actually initializing the RAID 5, to initialize the array on the onboard controller took almost a full day. If you're rebuilding a drive on the onboard controller, it could take hours and hours and hours, whereas on the Adaptech controller, we were able to initialize in a few hours, and if we needed to rebuild a lost drive, it would go much faster. That gives you more time to throw in a new drive and rebuild the data before you potentially could lose another one and then lose everything. In addition to performance and safety, a dedicated RAID controller gives you a lot of other benefits as well. So with the Adaptech controller we have today, we are using Adaptech Storage Manager, which allows you to monitor your array in a variety of ways. First of all, you can have it so sound an alarm if anything goes bad, which is really loud, by the way. I accidentally triggered it once. And you can also set it even to send you an email if something goes wrong with your array. So that's a pretty cool feature. Also, you can get huge onboard caches, up to 512 megs or even higher on a lot of RAID cards. So that allows you to get better performance just right out of the gate. Now, a big cache can be a problem, but you can get battery backups. So that means that even if the power goes out, well, you have a bunch of data stored in the cache, the battery will allow it to remain in the cache until the system powers back on, and then it can flush it to the disks. Now, speaking of caches, this is kind of a unique feature for Adaptech, but you can also supplement your RAID array with SSDs. So this is a MaxIQ cache device, and what it does is it allows us to get much, much better read performance out of our RAID 5 by taking anything that's frequently accessed and storing it on the SSD rather than on the hard drive. So we can run with our four port controller card here, we can run a three drive RAID 5 array, and then we can plug in a fourth drive, an SSD, and we can use that to enhance the performance. So you get all these advanced features and as well as your data reliability and performance. So thank you for checking out our RAID 5, RAID 6, brief touch on, and RAID 10, again, we talked only briefly, basically our RAID 5 episode of NCIX Tech Tips.